Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Dear Younger Me Conversations. I'm your host, Katora Duncan. So, Patrice, thank you so much for being with me here on God Be Big Conversations. Um, I'm sorry, Dear Younger Me Conversations, where we just share our life stories, share some things that that have gone on, and just um, hope that someone else can be blessed through our journeys, right? So, I would love you to tell the people who Patrice is. Well, first of all, it is an honor to even be asked to be here with you. it's not like we're strangers or anything like that, but uh, to be on the other side of this interview process is, uh, is very interesting, but it's gonna be fun. And I'm gonna remember that I'm not talking to just uh, no one I don't know, I'm talking to a friend, so which makes it awesome. So, and for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Patrice DeLisser. I am the CEO of Indigo Inspire, and uh, I have a company that is a music related, rated company that uh, deals with musicians, uh, with music conferences, and now we have entered the retail space and using that platform to generate funding for uh, mission projects. I'm a wife, mother of four, and I have been married. I cannot believe I'm gonna say this, it's odd, but I didn't realize until after we talked last time, um, I've been married 39 years, it's crazy. Uh, Yeah, I got married young, young, and to see the time go by, it's just like, wow, so much to, unpack in a short amount of time with us. So 39 years. That's crazy. Whew. That's that is that's a lifetime. <laughs> that's 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 a lifetime for sure. For sure. That um, a lifetime. And it's it's interesting because you don't see life passing like that because you're just living life. Um mm-hmm. and then of course you know by the time you uh when you're single you don't you know you you you're living life a certain way you get married um, and I didn't have, ch- we didn't have children when we got married. So we were living a certain way. And then by the time we did have children, then is when you start seeing the kind of clock a little bit, but it all, you know, it seems to slow down somewhat because you're in, now you're in the mind space of raising a child and comes another child and a third child and the fourth child. So it becomes all these plates you're kind of spinning between marriage and four kids and everything else that surrounds their upbringing. And then when you start reaching the uh, area of now they're, you know, young adults, um, for the most part, it's like, oh, wow, the time went by, but then again, I didn't feel it. So Mm. it's pretty interesting. So that really is. So tell, tell me, tell us a little bit about, uh, what life was like before getting married. So if you don't mind me asking, how old were you when you got married? Uh, 22 and 23, when we got married. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 So what was life for you at 22 and 23? Like what, what was your life like socially? Were you in school? What, mm-hmm. what, were, you doing? what were you doing? Uh, 22 and 23 was, uh, uh, just college years, finishing college years. Um, and particularly for me, um, just, I, I, even being in school, I still had no direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I had to say that because uh, I was thinking about the questions because you, you know kind of gave me got, gave you a heads up as to what the questions will be, and I kind of actually right there kind of parked because I said, "Wow, what was what was my mind space like at the time?" Um, and then when I think about it, I was living life, but at the same time, um, I had a dangerous, um, non-directional life. Um, you know, you major in certain, um, you know, whatever your course of study is going to be, all that sort of stuff, but how that was going to play out, you know, I didn't, I just lived my life for that day. Yeah, or for that no idea. Class. <laughs> you know, no, no idea. No um, and then also sort of a dangerous sense of lack of responsibility with certain things that, because you just didn't have maturity level to handle, um, you know, you went from 18 from being on high school, now you're in college, and they they tell you you're an adult now. Um, but unless you had some real structured preparation for that, um, even within the church upbringing, um, there was only they only took you so far, uh, which was the big thing was you know just you know live a holy life, um, but life applicable skills of how to navigate things as simple as 
banking, as simple as you know what it means to um, take care of your credit, uh, and all those really core foundations that that needed to be in place. Um, you know, sad to say, I lack that, and um, and so I'm just living living life. But like I said, that's what I really mean. And I, you know, I if I had an opportunity to talk to Patrice then, what I've learned now, oh, it'd be a totally different conversation. Absolutely, but that's that what you said is so true. Like 22, 23, we we think we grow. We we think we know so much more than we know. And I think when you come to the understanding, even at 41, that there's so much more for you to learn, it's humbling. Yeah. Right. It it keeps you at a space of just like, wait a minute. (laughs) I didn't realize there was so much that I needed to know to be successful or quote unquote successful in this life. And then it just, it's also humbling because like, you're like, Lord, I know I need you. Like, yeah. Ain't no way. Ain't no way in the world I could do this without you because it's just so much that I don't know. So with you know, all the you know, what was so sad to say though, even at that age, uh, when I think about it, um, you know, being raised in the church and being constantly involved in church activities. I mean, we were always, there's always something that um that was planned for. Um, you know, teens and young adults and stuff like that. So um, I don't lament any of that. But what I do lament is even in that, I did not let it become internalized. Mm-hmm. I had a, I had a guardrail based off of uh, traditional things that I had learned, and I had did I did have a reverential respect for God. It's you know Himself, but that real heart relationship that that should click in and be um, that, uh, that lighthouse directionally in terms of my character, my thinking, I didn't have. So even the employment of scripture into my life, that was pretty much non-existent except for, you know, trying to remember our scripture or remember, memorize the scripture for, you know, classes we'd have before the main service, that kind of thing. But that actually lockstep um, and letting the Holy Spirit really be my God at a young age, um, that I say that probably, that's the biggest, that is the biggest uh, regret that, um, that I have because that would have definitely helped to um, guide. guide me. Yeah, and I was just thinking, I, was just, I just kind of veered off because I was just thinking just so many things clicking in my head as we're talking. It would have guided me and anchored me even in the things I said earlier about responsibility. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So with that being the space that you were in, what was, what was, get, how did you come to the point where you and your fiance at the time or boyfriend at the time were like, okay, we're going to get married at 22, 23. Well, it, uh, that's a funny story because actually I did not even live. Um, I lived in Philadelphia, but then when I went to college, I went to Mar- I went uh, to school in Maryland. Um, so I didn't even know uh, who that would one day who would become my husband. I just happened to come home on a weekend um, just to visit for the weekend. And I met my would-be husband, didn't know he would be my husband, obviously. <laughs> um, after we went to, I went to church that weekend and then the mothers of the church, and there were a few of them who always just had their doors open for young people all the time. And we always knew the ones who cooked. So, you know, when you're a starving college student, you know what house to go to. Uh, and this particular house I had gone to. And um, so, if, you know, some of the friends I grew up with in church and stuff, they were all there, you know, nobody's married, that kind of thing. Everybody's, you know, just, you know, 18, 19 years old and um, having a great time. So when I walked into the, uh, the the sister's house that who was offering the dinner for everybody um I was just glad to see you know my friends and reconnect with them and um but when I came in the house um if you know some you know there's Philadelphia houses that have what they call is the the term was the vestibule remember the square (laughs) box Uh, (laughs) and the entryway 
you know, everybody has these grand entrances now and atriums and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when you're in a row house in Philadelphia, you have that little section that was like a little box that you came into, you know, you hang your coat, put your shoes there, and then you went through another entryway. Like a couple of steps, you went inside the main, in the, in the living room. Right. And so just as I went through that vestibule um, and seeing my friends and I'm seeing everybody, in my peripheral vision, there were two young guys sitting on a sofa, um, sitting on the couch by the front window, but I just, I just saw peripheral vision and, but I was focused on really, keep, you know, reconnecting my friends. They saw me, it's, it's almost like cheers, like, hey, Norm, you know, <laughs> hey, Patrice, you know, and we were just laughing, talking. And then we always, though, got in, engaged in deep philosophical, biblical discussions. Ha, huh, funny for a girl who didn't necessarily um, apply those things, but yet they were still in there. Yeah. So yeah. we would have these discussions and it was always just really deep and just kind of finding our way. And so as I'm having this discussion, all of a sudden, one of these young men that is sitting on the sofa gets up. Once again, I just kind of noticed, but didn't notice, you know, cause I really wasn't paying attention per se, but he made his way over to where I was talking with uh, one of the other people. And he was just standing there. And I'm kind of like, now it's a little ear, you know, uncomfortable. Like, what? like, I mean, you almost want to say, can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, he tried to interject, I guess, he must have been over here in the conversation that we were having. And he tried to interject, I guess, you know, what he thought, you know, he could include in the conversation. Mm. And then in my, I'm not saying it, but in my head, I'm thinking, I don't know who you are. You need to go back over there and sit down. <laughs> um, so it didn't, the conversation after he kind of stood there, you know, whatever, and tried to interject something, I just kind of cut, you know, cut it off. And then uh, the conversation was having a friend. And then I just kind of went back to what I was doing. And then we left. So went back, never saw this person, you know, for, I didn't see him again. Went back to school, back okay. in there, and came back home again for, um, for a weekend just to visit my home church, my family. Uh, and I came on another weekend where, man, somebody else was cooking. And it was another <laughs> one to cook too. And we went to her house. And when I walked in, um, the same two guys. I'm like, well, what is this? Okay, but it's none of my business. It's not my house. So um, once again, seeing my friends again, and sitting down talking. And this time, um, the brother of this young, of this other guy, he comes over and he introduces himself and he just, you know, just, but not, not nothing crazy, just like, hey, you know, whatever. And I said, nice to meet you. And he says, um, you know, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a college student, I'm a student in Maryland, blah, blah. Oh, what's your major? And I said, at the time it was, um, it's biology. And mm -hmm. so he said, oh, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm, you know, I'm pre-med. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, well, I know, what are you studying? I said, well, I'm doing some things here. And I said, and I had a, um, a part-time job at NIH, which was like one of the leading uh, like science research um, facilities in the country, if not the world. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if people have heard of NIH before, and, you know, uh, I'm going to mention the name because, because he used to be the director of one of the uh, uh, departments there, like Dr. Fauci, people like that, mm -hmm. uh, these main brainiac uh, researchers were there. And I was uh, an assistant research in cancer research at the uh, at NIH. So, so we got talking, you know, medical as much as I knowledge that I had. And he was interested really in the research aspect. Uh, and what's funny, he does research today. Even today, he does research. So he was really intrigued by it. Mm -hmm. So now we, he and I are now talking. So we grab a plate. I got a plate. He's sitting on the opposite table side of the table of me, and we just get into a conversation about research and all this sort of stuff, blah, blah. The brother gets his plate and comes at the end again. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just, he, he's, he's like, once again, the same person, like, can I help you? <laughs> mm. um, and so after we had the lunch, then after it was over, they said, hey, are you gonna go back to church because they're doing an afternoon program? So got an afternoon program, 
And uh, one of my friends, which is the daughter of the mom who hosted us that afternoon, she said, hey, Patrice, um, I don't have your number. Can, you know, can I get it? And I'll give you, know, so I give you a call. I said, hey, no problem. Wrote the number down, passed it to her and was done. Unbeknownst to me that he had asked her to get my number and she gave him my number. Now, I didn't find this out until years later. I mean, when I tell you years later, like we were married years later and I was like, are you sick? Because, <laughs> because I would have been like, no way. So anyway, he ended up calling me out of a, like a couple of weeks later and I get a call. My roommate tells me, hey, somebody call you. And, you know, this is his name. I'm not gonna put his name out there. This, this is his name. And um, I said, I don't even know who this person is, but whoever it is, they'll give me a call back. And he called again and he said who he was. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Deal still didn't click, um, but I'm like, okay. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna ditch this guy. Cause yeah. I don't know, you know, I don't know how you got my number, but I'm gonna ditch you. So, mm -hmm. and then this still small voice, don't be mean. Be nice to him. It's okay to have a friend. And then I was like, now see, this is where the whole, this is where I'm now getting this, my first kind of voice from the Holy Spirit, like, oh, brother, come on, man. And I thought, okay, let's be nice. Let's be a Christian young lady, be nice. So we had a couple minute conversation hung up. Then he called again. And I thought, yeah. Then he sent me a card. Then he started writing. Well, and then the rest is history. Oh, sweet. He was pursuing though. He oh, no, no, seriously. He was actively pursuing for sure. Yeah. He was pursuing. So how long did you guys date before getting married? Uh, we dated two years before we got married. Okay. So what would you tell your now for almost 40 years down the line? What would you tell yourself about how would you tell yourself to prepare for the for the journey ahead? You know what? I would have said pump the brakes because there was still those el those elements of uncertainty, those mm -hmm. elements of immaturity, um, and it wasn't. I, it, it was. I wouldn't say it was infatuation. It really wasn't that because um, I really started deeply caring for him, but I didn't know who I was. And I didn't give myself room to grow. And I also didn't give myself an opportunity to, to voice that to him um, about the fact that I really wasn't ready for a serious relationship um, and not giving him the room to understand that and giving him the room to say, hey, I get it, it's okay. You know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll slow this down. Not to say it had to stop or to break anything off as much as it was, just the space to um, to grow some more in my own in, in, in my uh, my own self. Wow! So it sounds like communication, or how to communicate like what you needed, um, while still you know being concerned about what he needed, but kind of prioritizing what you needed in that moment to help you to be the better you. So in in this time, this forty years, how how have you what what are some things that you've learned to implement in communication? with your husband to, to get those points across when you need to make those decisions like, wait, we're moving too fast or I need room to grow or things like that. Cause we're still growing, we're always about. You know, that's that's an interesting question. And to be honest with you, um, I didn't learn that right away mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. even going into marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause at this point uh, when we got married, he was now in medical school himself. And, um, and I was just trying to be the you know, the wife, um, I would, what was interesting though, I was determined that we were not having children before five years. I don't know what that was about. Um, not, no, and I say that not in a, in a negative sense as much as it was, that was, I did have a, a line drawn. Mm -hmm. And that line drawn for me was, uh, even though I was married, I also felt like, I don't know, I don't know this guy, which is funny, funny to say that, but mm -hmm. I really felt that way, even though I married him, I'm feeling like I don't know you well enough to have children with you. And I need to know who, a little more about who you are before I would think of wanting to have a child with you. So I, that resolve at that point was, um, 
I stuck to my I stuck to my guns on that one. And then of course, when I was ready to have a child, uh, he wasn't ready. And um, that became a little source of uh, just, yeah, it, 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 it was a source of, you no know, contention is too hard, it's too strong of a word, but it, it, we didn't agree. That, well, yeah. That's a good term. We didn't, we didn't agree. As, like I said, I felt like I was ready and then uh, he wasn't ready because he was still in pursuit of you know, his career at that point. So was he ready before when you weren't ready? No, we were both fine with that. Okay. okay. Oh, no, no. I mean, because, we you know, we got, we hung out, we took day trips, we took weekend trips, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, no, uh, we, we were both, we were both okay with that. I think he, he, he was having such a great time, just not, you know, with just the two of us, that the insertion of another human being that was not going to be Hey, we're here babysitting. This is like someone's going to come here, and we have to take care of that. Yeah, that was a, that long-term commitment to it. No, at that point, he wasn't ready for it. But obviously, when we did, we did have a child. Um, yeah, he was. He was. He was in full. He was. He was in full gear. Okay, gotcha. Well, I think that's that's. Uh, I love that you shared that one because there are a number of things sometimes that we have decisions that we have to make right in life that we may not be on the same page about. Um, finances is always a big thing, um, health, kids, they're always big things. And then, you know, figuring out how to um, deal with not necessarily deal with not being on the same page, deal with those levels of tension um, while still walking in love, while still making a decision to, you know, be husband and wife, while still going through life's journey, um, those are those those are real real feelings. Yeah, right? yeah, real, yeah, real feelings. yeah. It's not always you know peaches and cream, and sometimes um, it's those things that I'm thankful that you share because sometimes people don't know. Like, what do I do when me and my husband don't agree? We just break up? No, you you deal with the tension. <laughs> we have you know we be each other's. Um, I, I call them sandpaper. Sometimes we yeah. you know we, we deal with it. We we walk through it. We we can make a decision. It sounds like you guys made a decision that. Um, we were going to figure it out, <laughs> whatever that. Well, like. I, you know, it would it, it it would not be the full story if I just kind of left it like that. Uh, and I know one of it just nasty park there, but um, I was determined. I I still wanted a child, yeah. and then you know I did my you know I was did my routine checkups and things like that, and I couldn't understand at this point um, because I had stopped taking the pill and all that kind of thing. Um, but I still wasn't having, you know, nothing was happening. And, um, and I did um, go and just kind of talk to my, my, my gynecologist about, you know, hey, what, you know, what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, and come to find out I have PCOS. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was a, that was a major problem. And I should have really dug more into my own personal health because there are signs of that um, along the way, even in my teen years that were showing me that something was wrong, but I didn't know exactly what particularly call it until I was finally diagnosed with PCOS. So I just, now my chances of having a child was like, you know, zoo, mm -hmm. like, okay. Um, so at that point, when I was given that diagnosis, I'm like, okay, there's gotta be some way that we can do this. She said, okay, well, no, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, whatever. Um, and then we'll see what happens. And then, so we did X, Y, and Z and um, still um, still nothing for a minute. And then when I end up did end up getting pregnant, I didn't even know I was pregnant because all of a sudden one day I was just like an excruciating pain. I mean, just like, um, my, like my husband had to take me out of the house and I could barely walk out the house. And he took me, rushed me to, they could call my, um, my primary care physician took me over there. Cause I was having such bad abdominal pain, um, that I'm using tears. And so they whisked me back into the, uh, treatment room. And when I remember he uh, put his hand on my lower belly, I just went completely bonkers. And he said, okay, we got a situation here. Uh, let's get her out. 
And then when I was, they this now by you know emergency tried to take me down to one of the main hospitals in Philadelphia. Um, come to find out, I mean, at that point, once I got there and they did whatever they examined the ultrasound, the whole nine yards, um, they had an emergent take me emergently into surgery. Um, come to find out, I had an, an ectopic pregnancy. And for those who'll be watching this, that means um, I there's a pregnancy is forming, but it's forming in the tube. Um, and it was about to rupture. So that would have been like a major situation and it was already a major situation. So because of that surgery and, and it ended up being um, a, a fantastic surgeon, I mean, fantastic um, surgeon at Penn, um, but I also lost my tube in the meantime. So PCOS, now no tube. And, you know, the, and not, you know, the anatomy, you have two tubes, but now mm -hmm. I'm down one. So PCOS, one tube, now my chances of having children are pretty much practically almost slim to none. Um, so I ended up going to, you know, recovering from that and just feeling like, you know, kind of defeated, to be honest with you. Um, but then I ended up going to that same surgeon who did the emergency surgery ended up being my infertility specialist. And so we got to talking and so on and so forth. And then so we started another regimen <laughs> of uh, another you know, way of trying to see if this can happen. Um, and then I it actually ended up getting pregnant. Um, it's, it's just too much drawn out information, but of how that happened. But anyway, I did end up getting pregnant. And then um, in my second trimester, um, I started bleeding heavily and then I lost the pregnancy. So now it's just like, how many blows can somebody take? Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm, there's a lot of women out there who um, are not able to have children at all. So, you know, I, 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 I get it, even though I ended up having children, but that's a, that's a miracle story altogether. Um, but um, yeah, so it was pretty rough. <laughs> Crazy. Um, the fact that you've gone through all of that, and that's not even before having the four that you have. <laughs> like, that right there is nothing but the grace of God. Um, and his will be done, right? No, no. matter what, <laughs> no matter what uh, our bodies say, no matter what doctors say, no matter what, whatever, his will be done. So yeah. Wow. So when you did finally, how long was that process? How long till you had your first um, full pregnancy? Full thing? Um, I, yeah. After I recovered from, from the loss of the pregnancy, it, 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 I had to take a minute okay. because the body, what, what was so sad for what even made it worse, to be honest with you, is after I um, had the baby um, that they couldn't, you know, obviously didn't make it. Um, you come home, but then like a couple of days later, like Couture, I was, my breast got filled with milk. I wasn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. And then I, I remember my gown was wet and I went to the bathroom like, what is that? Like it didn't click. Um, Cause I thought, you know, that happens after you've had full term and you know, whatever. But then my gown was wet and I saw that my breasts were leaking and it was milk. And I just was completely shattered. Um, I don't have a baby. And like, I felt like this was like the most cruelest thing that could happen. Like, why would my body do this for a baby that can't take it? Mm -hmm. So that was a whole like spinning moment in my, you know, in my psyche about all of this. So I, I took a minute. Um, before. And then when I kind of took an emotional deep breath and uh, went back to the, uh, to my specialist, um, she said, okay, all right, let's, 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 you know, let's start this particular regimen again and we'll do something different. And so um, when I ended, ended up getting pregnant, 
you're not even happy per se because you're so petrified. And, uh, but once I crossed that line of past that time when I lost the first baby in the second trimester, I just sort of feel like, okay, okay, now I can decompress. Now I can enjoy this. Now I can ride the rest of this out. And so, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but that in and of itself, uh, PCOS, one tube, and to get pregnant this time and to, uh, full term. So we have baby. So, um, wow. It's interesting because as I was preparing for today, I was like, what do I ask Patrice? Like, what, Lord, what do you want to hear from her? And children was the thing that kind of stood out to me. Hmm. Um, <laughs> so because now that we're having this conversation, we hadn't talked about, I mean, we had a great conversation last yeah. week, mm -hmm. but we hadn't talked about that. And children was the thing that stood out to me. And I didn't know, like, I've known you for Kaylin will be 11. So 12 years, maybe. Yep. Yep. Before, and, yep, yep, before, before your daughter. Yep. Correct. My daughter. Mm -hmm. And even so, and I don't know if we've ever had this conversation. So even with my daughter, I gave birth to her. And then after my, um, my uterus wouldn't contract. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think we may have had this conversation. So yeah, my we, uterus wouldn't contract. We, we, we actually talked around that time too. Yeah. And I was in yeah. the hospital for like, so I, they had to take everything out. And I was just like, what the world? Like, but then your body is going through all these things. And in the midst of it, you feel like I'm the only one going through this. Mm -hmm. And little do you know, there are people around you that have had various situations that can say, you know, you'll be okay. Or this is some of the things that you can look out for. These are some of the things that you can look out for. Mm -hmm. And because you've gone through, like, I've never even thought about when you lose a baby, how your body could still react as if because you delivered the baby. Correct. Right. You know what I mean? Correct. I never even thought about that. Um, so that that's like, wait, what? <laughs> like that's enlightening in so in so many ways. Um, so I know there's so much, um, and there's so much that someone's getting out of this story that they um are out of this conversation that they may not have even come for, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. but there, but there's so much to, to get out of that in regards to um processing, in regards yeah. to you know taking time for emotional health, in regards to you know, you could have said, I, I'm good, like this is this is too much. Yeah. I don't want to do this anymore. You could have done that. You've even um, and I can I don't know what your husband was going through, but he was probably going through a oh no, no, in all honesty, at this point, the emotional roller coaster that he was on and not that he wasn't sad because he definitely he was actually he was he 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 saw it and you know it's like what can he do like it's he's feeling it but he also is watching me go through it right at the end which added to what he was feeling um so you know he tried to you know be of comfort the best way he could um but, you know, we just kind of silently, you know, so it wasn't even like we had a conversation about it, but we just kind of silently went through it. But I will, I mean, I'm going to back up with something because this is something that I think what to after that first, after that first loss, um, not the loss of my two, but the loss of the baby, uh, my first child. I had a family friend who came to visit me at home and still recuperating from, you know, from everything. And she came over and well-meaning as she was, but she did not understand that the words that were about to come out of her mouth were very hurtful. And she said, just kind of, you know, almost um, as a matter of fact, you'll be fine. You're not the only one that's lost a baby. And I remember when, when she said it, the sting of that. And at that point, I was ready for her to go. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember how much longer she stayed because all I know is that though she was gone, I don't know if I gave her the signal that I think you need to leave or I don't know if I said I need to go lie down or whatever, but if she did end up leaving. And I'll never forget that just stuck with me for a long time. Like, and I would say to anybody, don't dismiss, don't ever, let me just stress this, don't ever in your entire life 
dismiss what someone is going through. I don't care if a million people it has happened to. For that individual, it's them. Mm -hmm. And we're told in scripture that we are to grieve with those who grieve and that we are to sing songs with those who rejoice. We're not to go and tell people, well, you're not the only one. And, you know, statistics, no, you know, get rid of all that. Leave that at the door. And if that's even in your vocabulary and you think you're going to give some type of comfort to somebody, it's better for you to stay home. Well, stay, stay home. Don't, don't say it. And then sometimes, you know, people just say stuff because they don't know what else to say. And I think it's the art of being quiet. It's okay to just. There's ministry. Come yeah. on, let's. There is the flex of ministry in being quiet. It's okay just to be sit. quiet. It's okay yeah. to sit. Just sit. You know, just sit, be quiet. Ask if, you know, would you like something to eat or whatever? Or if you want to sit down and read a book and just say, you know what? I'm just here to keep you company. You don't even have to say anything. I'm just here to let you know I'm here for you. Yeah. Done. Awesome. But if that's anything else other than that, be quiet or stay home. <laughs> or stay home. Indeed, indeed. So with all of that, now you have, and definitely not crossing over or breezing over, there was a lot of process there. There's so much in all of that. Now having these children who are literal, I mean, you know, the Bible says that good children are a gift from the Lord, right? Yeah. But you, but this is literally a process. Well, you know, well, gift. guess what? After I had our first one, I wasn't trying again because I felt like, God had already blessed me with a miracle in and of itself. You know, it's to, scientific statistics would say based off of my, you know, my makeup, uh, my chances of having a child was pretty much close to zero. Mm -hmm. So to have one after we had our first daughter, um, I was, I was, we were good. Gucci, good. Um, enjoyed her coming home, enjoyed those, those early years with her. I mean, I was immersed in that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't try again. And it wasn't until close to five years later that I wasn't feeling great. I was kind of nauseous, blah, blah, blah. blah. And uh, I don't know if I, now this part, I don't remember if I ended up getting tested to see if I was or not, because I knew I would. I think I may have gone to see if I was tested or not just to, Oh, I know exactly what it was. Um, I was going to um, I was going to work, and this is in the dead of winter. Um, this is like December, November, December, and in November, December. And then I was remember thinking, I came home with a really bad flu. Like um, I came home from work, it was going around. Something was horrible was going on with everybody, and I remember I was getting ready to take. Um, some type of over-the-counter medication. And something said, and it, oh, I don't remember what it was. It was third flu. This third flu has not sponsored this yet. Ha ha. <laughs> um, but I was going to take third flu. And in my second time, I've heard this, um, don't take anything. Just make sure you're not pregnant. I don't even know where that came from. Because I'm thinking to myself, I'm sick as a dog. I want to take this over-the-counter medication. And I just want to go somewhere and lie down but something said just go ahead and just check so oh I remember now I ended up just like dragging myself <laughs> to the closest pharmacy getting one of those tests like you know I don't know why I waste this ten dollars but um but just just to give myself I guess peace of mind that I wasn't doing something hurtful and when that thing came up positive I literally froze like There's no way. Like, how did this happen? <laughs> how did this happen? How did this happen? I mean, you know how it happened, but how did this happen? Yeah. And so, obviously, I never took the over counter medication because now, immediately, instinctively, I went into protective mode. You know, nothing's going in my body that's going to whatever, um, particularly with of my history. So, mm -hmm. when I got my appointment, Double check with the doctor. Call us. I got, it came, it came apart. She said, "Well, you know, let's do a check because you know these things kind of." And she did that blood test, and next thing you know, she called me with the results. She says, "Yes, you are. Congratulations." And I'm like, "But because I was high risk, 
she still followed with me the 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 entire the rest of the way. So um so then we had our second daughter that in of itself is a whole different conversation but we, we did end up having her and um then close to so they're cut they're spaced apart so the first two are like, like almost six years apart and then between the second one then the time I had my third one almost five years apart and then that was once again not trying minding my business watching my edges um and I'm like oh my goodness so okay all right so two girls but now I'm thinking, oh, well, if I am, I, I hope it's a boy. And sure enough, our third child was a son. I'm, that's, my, that's my guy. And uh, love my girls, but you know, it's like my guy. We talked about this. And um, then a year later, I'm not feeling great. I'm pregnant again. Wait, hold on. This tube has now become a sliding board. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait. Hold up. One, two, Had four kids. <laughs> one, two, four kids. PCOS. Only God. Only God. Only God. In his timing, in his way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. 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 This is funny. I got that. This one, I got, I have to put this story in it. And, and my husband watched this program. He's going to choke me. But anyway. Don't choke her. No, no, no. Um, so. After I had our son, it's a year later, I had just made this big meal the night the day before. And it wasn't big, like heavy, heavy, but it was just like, you know, it was, you know, whatever, made a meal. And so the next day I had a lot of indigestion, like, oh my goodness, like, oh, what is that? Mm -hmm. um, and he was on his way to, to work. And I was sitting at the bottom of the stairs and babies upstairs. I think the, the girls were in school. And I said, hey, you know, babe, I, I wonder if I'm pregnant. And he, as, I'm, as I said it, he's, as, as I say it, he's walking by and I said, well, you know, on your way out, can you get a pregnancy test for me? He looked at me and said, you know what? You better get your own pregnancy test and walked out the door. You're like, I got he, time he's like, I got time for this, whatever. And so I'm like, that was rude. So anyway, went out and I said, let me just go ahead and check this. Bam, I was pregnant again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wow. Won't he do it? <laughs> Won't he do it? And he did it. He did it. He, he did, did it. it. So going through all of this, if knowing what you know now, how would you have encouraged yourself through that time? Oh, Katora, why you make me dig deep in this? Um, how do I? Hmm. You know, I was so immersed in the fact that I even had children in the first place, that um, I would tell myself, it's gonna be okay, trust God. The same one who can cause Sarah and Abraham, not that I was old at the time to have a child, but that can put it in circumstances that would say you can't, that God is able. He still left you with one. Trust the God of the one. Oof. That is something to my heart. Trust the God of the one. Like if there's a chance, then there's, even when there's not a chance, like God can make a chance. He makes a way out of nowhere, right? Yep. With rivers in the wilderness. Yes, very much so. And sliding boards out of one. <laughs> sliding boards out of one. Wow. Um, so with all of these beautiful babies, grown people now, young adults, um, how are you, or how would you, how do you encourage them in relationships? Because I think that's something that sometimes we either overlook um, or don't pay attention to until it's like right in front of us. Um, and we shared, I shared this with you last week too, just the way the culture is when it comes to purity or, you know, saving yourself or being mindful of what you're doing and how you're moving in relationships is just like, oh, they're going to do it anyway. So I'm not going to tell them, but there's so much that we still need to teach our children and prepare them in that space. So what would you, or what are you telling your, your, your children, your younger me's 
about relationships and just what do they do with themselves? Well, I'm going to take, I'm going to tell you exactly how, what I did. I learned and I, instead of talking, being able to talk to myself at that age and go with those years of raising the children, I talked to them as if I was all talking to myself, what I would have wanted someone to tell me. So mm -hmm. I didn't wait until they were in their teenager. These were conversations that, you know, age appropriate to just run around the dinner table or just in passing, not in passing, but, you know, we're just talking, just, you know, a random conversation that kind of goes in that, into words, that trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, about, number one, it was the relationship with God, with Christ. Mm -hmm. That was the first part. Mm -hmm. Because even with the second part, without that, relationship with Christ for themselves. You know, we're not grandfathered in because you, you're a person of faith and your children are gonna be birth and they're gonna be proclaiming the name of the Lord, absolutely not. But pointing them in that direction so that they would hopefully find him. But obviously, you know, I'm not hoping that they'll stumble and find him as much as it is we're living and trying to have a household of faith that they're experiencing what that's like you know, as best as we possibly can in our fallen state. Um, perfect at it, absolutely not. Um, but I was really planting and praying that I was planting seeds that they, um, that would at one point, if, you know, mature for them inside them and they would have a relationship with Christ himself. And one of the things I always told them, also you get one shot at being young. So, Use your young years, you know, to live your life. You do not have to be anchored with anybody. Get to know who you are. Go travel, go see things, go get life experiences. And I'm not talking about sexual experiences. That's, that's so overrated. And not that I don't love it. I'm not saying that. It's just, um, but that's not life. That's not everything about life. Because if you don't have a good mental balance and a maturity about who you are, uh, you will find yourself in dangerous places, even in that area. Mm -hmm. So just really pouring that into them and the responsibility of the fact that they're, they're young souls interacting with other young souls and the responsibility of what you do to another soul. And when I started talking to them about the responsibility and the impact that they would have towards another soul of God, whether they knew the Lord or not, was, was not the case, was not even uh, a consideration. The fact that you knew as a young believer, wherever you are into your relationship with Christ, that that was still another soul that you were interacting with. And ask yourself, how much responsibility do you want to take for impacting positive and or negative towards another soul that you will have to one day be held accountable for? Mm -hmm. And so that's how I started having these conversations with them about the responsibility of caring for another soul. We look at people as people and we look at them as transitory people you know, just this passing from one to the other. I don't care if it's the grocery store, driving the car, whatever. How many times do we ever think of that next person, the car is another soul? Mm -hmm. How many times do we think that we go past people in the grocery store, the checkout counter? That's another soul. And so we talk, we start, stop talking about prosperity and let's, talk, let's now shift the conversation to soul responsibility. Mm -hmm. What, what does that mean to you, soul responsibility? Soul responsibility is just, just that. It's the fact that how do I impact in a great way, in a positive way, what, what do I bring to the table to add positivity to another person's life? And particularly if you're a believer and you have a relationship with Christ, you know what your mandate is. The mandate is to go make more disciples. How dare we not take that responsibility seriously? When you don't teach young people or young teens or whatever, that that young person is another soul that you can 
spread light to, then when you don't have that mindset, going to bed with them is easy because you don't think it was another soul. They're just meeting your needs. Um, business interactions. Um, you're just trying to break, you know, have a deal with somebody. You don't think of them that, you know, making a spiritual impact with them. Think of it past just where we are right now. We're talking eternity here. Yeah. Eternity mindsets. And I think that's, that is, that is so, um, I'm challenged, right? So my kids are 13 and 11. I almost forget. Um, 13 and 11. And sometimes it's just like, okay, you're a kid. Be a kid. I want you to be a kid. But then I start thinking about, wait, I have literally five more years till my son gets out of high school. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> your, your life and which where I have um, direct, um, like I can kind of tell you what to do and what not to do, but that time is becoming shorter. And I don't want to necessarily tell you what to do and what not to do, but I want to teach you how to make good decisions for yourself. But yeah. in a part of that is teaching you how to be concerned about other people down to soul ties, down to regular manners, down, you know, down to all of those things, because this is, this is kingdom work yeah, that, yeah. You, that you that you have the responsibility to, to start now. Mm-hmm. Like if, if anything was to happen and you were to be taking the glory now, the Lord's not going to be like, oh, well, you didn't get a chance to do X, Y, and Z. Wow. You didn't get a chance to do X, Y, and Z because you're not 21. Mm-hmm. What did you do? What did you do with my son now at 13? Correct. What did you yeah. do with that? Yeah. And these are conversations that, still continue to happen today. This is not something that you necessarily hands off. Hands off. This is, you know, you asked me, how would I talk? I, I'm talking to them the way I wanted someone to pour into me. And so hopefully, you know, obviously they'll make their own decisions. They're, I mean, they'll have their own faith walk. Um, there have been decisions that have been made that are very life-changing for uh, particularly one of my kids. Um, so but that still doesn't negate me from still having the conversation and encouragement of getting back, get back, you know, get back in the game, get back in the spiritual, you know, and get back in the, in the flow because God is still the God of restoration and he restores years that the locals have eaten. And these are not just cliches. This is facts. Um, You know, did I make a lot of mistakes even, you know, still today? Yeah. But what I do, and I just had a conversation yesterday with our, my youngest daughter, and you know, she was talking about just kind of bad dreams that she was having, that kind of thing. You know, just do you ever have nightmares? I think that's what it was. She says, "Mom, you ever not have a, ever have nightmares?" And I said, um, "Actually, no. Um, you know, I may have dreams that are, you know, very emo- can be very emotionally challenging." Um, but. She said, because you're always listening to sermons and scriptures and things like that. I said, I do it intentionally because I want my default mechanism to go towards him in all circumstances. That was good. You know, it reminded me, I just, I remember one day I was um, in my room and I just finished listening to, it was probably Ele- Elevation Church, mm-hmm. uh, Stephen and my daughter comes in and she was like, mom, why do you love Jesus so much? I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, and at the time, she had to have been, so this is maybe four years ago, five or six. Yeah. And I was like, how do I explain this to you at five or six um, that you understand it? But I didn't, I couldn't even go that deep. I just, because I said, he's been too good. <laughs> so he's, he's been yeah. too good and he's been too faithful yeah. for me yeah. not to love him. For me not to respond in that way. Mm-hmm. And she just was like, okay, and just just as simple as that. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. And what else? But mm-hmm. I know it was impactful for me in that mm-hmm. moment to yeah. hear my baby one see yeah. that I love God. Yes, and yes. Two, Wasn't that awesome? Two, yeah. Yeah. And then two, like ask me a question. So much so that she had to ask me a question, but also it was planting a seed. Like, yes. I love him because he's he's good. <laughs> like he's yeah. done all this, all these things. Um, and if he, 
he just he takes care of us so it's um uh, that's that's powerful though thank you and, and, the, yeah, and the reminder is um and that lets me think because once again i do it not because i'm trying to impress anybody i do it because i know what my heart is bent towards if i don't have it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i know what my heart will do and so i heard um a live uh one time of from pastor john hannah out of chicago and he was doing the live and one of these things i just happened to i won't call it happened it was a blessing that i caught it but in the midst of his bible you know his bible study encouraging people he said you know people ask him how is it that you stay so consistent with the lord he said i didn't even hesitate he said because the world can offer me nothing jesus comes with benefits that you'll never know you'll never know so the benefits of me wanting to make sure I stay in his presence because I know what I am without him, I'd be worse without him. Oh, I'm, I'm intentional about that. So I do it because I'm hungering for him. And I want my default mechanisms, even in my dreams. So go back to what she was asking me about my dreams. I said, well, you know, I said, it's a funny thing you should ask. I said, funny you should ask me that stuff because I don't have nightmares but I will have dreams that are troubling. And it's interesting that even in my between state, between dream and being awake, and depending what the dream is, in my brain will call out to the Lord. So that planting of those seeds that I am intentionally gathering every day, all throughout the course of the day, you know, Someone would say, oh, well, she's just so spiritually deep. No, I'm, I know I would, I would be without him. Yeah. I'm just that desperate for him. I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell you just how desperate I am for him. And I really understand that this world is not my home. And so, and I really want to be in his presence and I really want to get this thing right. And I don't have anything right within me. But because he says, if I call on him and ask him, he will come in and sup with me. That's all. Hey, listen, don't get me started. <laughs> like, all I got to do is ask. And he'll come have a seat. Mm -hmm. And that that will be um, I, my encouragement. If, we, if anybody takes anything from this conversation, have a seat. Ask him to come in <laughs> and have a seat and, and watch what he'll do when we just make room for him. Watch what he'll do. And, and, and be prepared for what he's going to say because it's not always about and most times it's not about you're just you're doing exactly what i told you most times it's didn't i tell you not to or he and he's a good father right he's and he's a, and it's so and so nice and that's yes. it even yes. in correction yes it's still redemptive yes yes because he knows our states he knows that we are dust Yes. yes. So, you know, from one dust talking to another dust. Okay. <laughs> we had a pastor at my church, um, Pastor Moore. He passed away, I want to say almost three years now. And one one sermon, um, he said, look at your neighbor. He was saying how we're all dirt, right? <laughs> like we all came from dirt. And he was like, look at your neighbor and say, hey, dirt. I was like, hey, dirt. So I have a friend that we still call each other dirt to this day. Mm -hmm. As a reminder, it's loving, <laughs> but mm -hmm. we still call each other dirt. She's a little fairer than me, so I call her sand, but I'm dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's a simple reminder, but I remember yeah. that. Yes. Uh, that I am I am literally just dirt formed in the master's hands. Like, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. that, that's all I am. Patrice, this has been such, such an amazing conversation. So I've, I've learned so much. Um, I've gotten so much. I've learned how to, be quiet when I'm in somebody's presence. I don't have to say it. I don't have to say nothing. I can just have a seat. Mm -hmm. I've learned how to um, take time and communicate when I need more time, like not rush because somebody else wants me to rush into something, but be be community, be able to communicate in those moments. Even if it's, I don't, I don't have an answer for you. I just know I need time. <laughs> That's, I've learned how to communicate. I've learned that one, two, don't stop nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he's the god of the one he's the god of the one it don't stop nothing and that 
one thing that I didn't address when you said it, but that parenting is not, and I think most parents already know this, but I don't know if most children know this, that parenting doesn't stop at any specific space. You're always right. pouring in, you're always giving guidance, you're always um, assisting, right? And you're assisting the father in this journey. It may look different because your needs are different, mm -hmm. but parenting, parenting continues. Yeah. And mm -hmm. give yourself room for, don't be so hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't be so hard on yourself. It's easy to do that. So I'm telling myself, don't be so hard on myself because you carry around guilt for a lot of things. But at the end of the day, I got to let it go. Did you learn from it? Yes, I did. Did you move on? Yes, I did. Don't be so hard on yourself. Give yourself the room to forgive yourself. And I heard, uh, Bishop Jake said this in the sermon was a long time ago. It's okay to clap for yourself when you do good. That right there, that's a good thing. Because sometimes we're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to celebrate because this false humility. It's not. Clap for yourself. Clap for yourself. It's Thank okay you. to yeah. applaud yourself that you're not what you used to be and that you still know that you're on the journey, but celebrate your progress moments. Man, that thing shifted in me. And so I have adopted that. Like I'm clapping for myself because I'm still, I'm not the Patrice that, that was 19 years old that didn't have a clue. I can clap for myself. I didn't think that I would be able to have children, have a child, and that's no, no, nonetheless make it plural and say children and, the, and to be able to ra raise them and be actively involved in their life every day. And that I was able to do that with tons and tons of loads of laundry. You know, that there were times I'd be upset about the laundry, like these kids, they, you know, whatever, whatever. Now, now remember, mind you, these are the miracle babies. Yes. And I've got laundry up to my eyeballs. Um, and then one day, and I'll say this for, at the end, one day I was once again, I was listening to uh, music in the background and it was uh, Pastor Whitley Phipps. You know, if every people know Whitley Phipps is, he's a good friend of Obed Walker. Anyway. But in the, between his segments of just giving worship songs, just encouraging people in general, he then says, now look, look at the timing. I am, I have one load of laundry in there. I've got stacks all over the floor that I still have to do. And I'm trying to do all this while the kids are in school and so on and so forth, whatever. And he, all of a sudden out of clear book, I did hear this part because I have his song, his voice is so melodious and beautiful. But he, in, in between this one segment, I'm coming down the stairs with another load of laundry and just frustrated. Like, I'm just, I mean, I'm overwhelmed and blah, blah, blah. And he says, and to the mother who feels like she's overwhelmed because she's doing laundry and she can't get ahead of laundry. I'm not joking. This is exactly what happened. He says, stop and be grateful that you have socks to wash. Mm -hmm. check and checked and checked mm -hmm. because that Patrice who was didn't think she'd ever have children would have given anything to be able to wash one sock mm -hmm. and now the Lord had given me four pairs of feet of laundry to wash for I got you mm -hmm. Wow, we're going to end right there. Thank you so much, Patrice, for, for sharing your lessons and your life. I, I'm so thankful and appreciative of that. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in. Please follow us at God Be Big on Instagram and Facebook and at GodBeBig.com. Till next time.